Hello, everyone, wherever you are in the world. This is another episode of Page Turners Plus. Today, we have a very special discussion program for you. We'll be discussing Marcia Douglas's The Marvelous Equation of the Dread. To tell you a bit more about Marcia Douglas and this novel, we have Paula. Thank you, Raul J. Marcia Douglas is a Jamaican-American novelist and poet. She's a professor of Caribbean literature and creative writing at the University of Colorado Boulder. The Mar Marvelous Equations of the Dread, a novel in bass rhythm, is her third novel. The novel's reggae aesthetic blurs the lines between poetry and prose. Rooted in Rastafari liberty, it provokes comparison with Kai Miller's The Cartographer Tries to Map His Way to Zion. For whereas Kai Miller's Rastaman knows the way to Zion because he knows what Zion is, the Bob Marley of the Marvelous Equations of the Dread is less sure-footed. After his death, Bob finds himself in the presence of his Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie, neither knowing what Zion truly is nor how to find it. Bob is a prophet, but he is fallible. He's a soul warrior, but he is wounded. Having been dead for 15 years, Bob returns to Jamaica, transmogrified in the flesh of a fallen angel, to try to retrieve the Lion of Judah ring of his imperial majesty. He believes he must do so to fulfill the duty of a faithful son to his spiritual father. But when he arrives in Jamaica, Bob immediately forgets why he has set out on the journey. Ultimately, he will learn that he has been summoned by the people to fulfill a purpose far greater than the one he cannot remember. He will also learn that he must confront his earthly wounds to find his way to Zion. Thank you very much, Paula. And for those of you who are observant, you might have realized that we're one short today. Um, Francine is unavoidably absent, but we hope to have her back for the next episode. So to jump right into this, I guess I could ask, is this novel a novel which praises and rebukes Rastafari? I don't know who wants to jump off on that. <laughs> Any volunteers? I will. <laughs> I don't see any rebuke of Rastafari in the novel. I see a novel which praises Rastafari, um, which is grounded in Rastafari, but a novel which doesn't, I, I, I think generally this novel doesn't see anything as um, sacrosanct. Nothing is above criticism. I think that is the whole tone of this novel and nothing is, be is beyond questioning. So I see no rebuke. I see questioning, but I see no rebuke. That's actually a, a really strong point there, um, because I think with any religion or any type of, of culture, you would have um, aspects that could easily be questioned and that would make the outsider think hmm, this is a little strange or this is um not something that i'm accustomed to so that is a that is actually a good point because on my first reading i thought hmm this seems like rebuke but now that you mention it um it may not necessarily be a, a rebuke of rastafari but it's just a, a questioning or highlighting things mm. yeah if i, I may <clears throat> sorry eric that's okay um but i just wanted to sort of agree with paula um, and and Roger, you you are in your first impression. You mentioned that you felt as if it had a tone of rebuke. Um, I didn't get that. I I thought it was a very enlightening um, novel for the for persons who are probably not familiar with uh, Rastafari. Um, it will be interesting to see somebody of a generation well you're young so you we have that generation represented on this panel but people like paula and myself i think grew up in the height of the foundation of the era that's being defined in this novel so it it, uh, it more than likely resonates um you know more vibrantly if i may risk that um you know <laughs> that utterance, but um, but it'd be interesting to see what a young person who I think it's fair to say today may not be as conscious about Rastafari um, as 
back in the 70s, 80s, um, and even extending into the 90s. But I didn't see any rebuke. What I, what I saw was an enlightenment. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, they, uh, critical, uh, definitely critical in, in a lot of different aspects. Um, I enjoyed the historical groundings. Uh, that that was just in, enjoyable, but yes, I think it was critical. But I, I don't I don't think it was a rebuke of of, of Rastafari, and um, I I'm gonna say that I'm I'm a little bit younger than uh, than Tony and Paula, but I do remember I I remember Bob Marley. Uh, I remember the music, obviously in the seventies. I was I was a little kid. I remember when he died. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I also remember uh, that there was um, there the Rastafari community in in New Orleans. Uh, still is. Uh, I, I I know where they hang out. <laughs> and, uh, uh, natty Natty Dreads um, hang out in a certain section of the city. But uh, I, yeah, I I would I would say that I, I, that that culture was adjacent uh, to me in, in in the '70s, along with um, along with Black Power. Uh, so this book did bring back some some childhood uh, memories that I have, and so uh, yeah, I, I walk away. I would say, Tony, Tony, you used the word enlightened, right? I I, I would say that I, I walked away more enlightened about about Rastafari. Yeah, I, I just want to add further that that um, what the book did for me was to reawaken that consciousness that felt so much a part of my life when I was in the in my 20s um, and that's really indicative of how diluted maybe it has become oh, I don't know if it's just me turning up a, a ball head Paula but um, <laughs> but um, the thing about Eric you mentioned the Black Power movement and, and the Rastafarian movement being adjacent. It was almost like one continuum because as as that that Black Power movement um, started to plateau, the Rastafari movement was the movement that galvanized black people and sought to dignify us who we are, embrace ourselves, or hey, this, you know. I, I, I think the Rastafarian movement actually went deeper um, to us in the Caribbean than the Black Power movement. And and still today is what we, we hold on to as that ultimate um, identity as a Black person. And it's linkage to Africa, um, the, the, the African Messiah. It, you know, there's so many things going on there that Marcia Douglas brought out in that wonderfully written um piece of work yeah i mean i'll just jump in and say um i said anything from a uk context um you know we also have that that connection to rastafari as an organizing kind of community as a political entity um certainly when i was very young um if not so much in the same way today just to add that small thing i think this novel in in a way is overtly political but it's not political in the sense, the, the typical sense that we'd expect it. And we've done um, other novels this year that were um, were written um, centered in Jamaica, and they were overtly political, but definitely not in the same sense. Where the 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 bulk of the novel is overtaken by um, the movement, the Rastafari movement, and their political involvement in Jamaica. And we know at the end of the '60s, especially, there was a a, a widespread marginalization of Rastafari communities in Jamaica. And the fact that this novel is centered mainly on them in Jamaica, I think that's a political statement by Marcia um, uh, Douglas as well. Okay, so I would like to ask you, um, with, with the person, with the English, um, well, that's where you live now, okay? Because a lot of this novel touched on the significance of that migration that Jamaicans took to 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 the UK and and to be to be fair, I believe the scene in England, London, to be more specific at the time, um, provided a platform for the music, which is the anthem or the anthems of of Rastafari. Um, I think that provided a, a platform 
um, to get the music out there. And I believe that that's where the fertilization took place. And that's, that's, and that's how it permeated through in a global sense, right? So I think London played a very critical part in this whole link. And, and I, I believe Marcia Douglas was dealing with that as well um, in, in how she um, stitched together the novel. Well, it's funny you should say that. I mean, just this week, um, I had the good fortune to go and watch the Get Up Stand Up musical, which is playing in London at the moment. Uh, it's a kind of a biography of Bob Marley uh, with the background um, of all his music. And it does deal with his time in the UK um, and his own kind of personal journey. And through it, I think, I say that because I think that it's 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 it's, it's in the West End of London. It's, it's a great musical. The, the music is fantastic. It's all live. Um, and I think it's been insanely popular. And part of that is because there is a, a strong Caribbean community in the UK um, that's come out to support it, but also because of the influence of the music that has its global kind of, that's made Bob Marley a global superstar, means that, that all sorts of people are coming to see it as well. If you go sort of half an hour before it shows, the queues around that theatre are insane. Like it's wildly, wildly popular. And I do think... Um, so I think you mentioned the kind of space of London as a, a a space of spreading of the movement. I think it's because the earlier generation of, of Caribbean migrants, so the kind of very first 1950s era, their children often are sort of the 20 years later group and those are the ones that Bob Marley moves with those are the ones that are Rastaf that kind of adopt Rastafari as a kind of as a cultural political response to the racism that they're facing in the UK right um, and they're the ones who are also fighting racism in a different sort of way so in the early days you have to fight almost physically on the streets because you've been attacked in gangs um, and that's just a reality that black people in the UK are facing um, when the earth's the first generation of Caribbean migrants in the sense, let me, as a historian, I have to rephrase that. The first generation of this mass post-war migration is what I'm trying to say. Um, and their children are less willing to be accepted as outsiders. They're West, they're, you know, the first, we always think of this kind of first generation of post sorry, this first post-war generation of migrants as being temporary, but ended up staying. Whereas their children are, are British, feel they have a right to the society. I mean, their parents were too, right? But, but they feel like they have a much stronger sense of they can't be denied their rights in quite the same way. They're not foreigners, they have the same accent, they went to the same schools. Um, I don't think I'm answering your question very well at all. <laughs> do you think, do I think London is a special place in that sense? Yes, but it's not only London, because I think there are other cities in the UK where also this kind of pollination of ideas is happening. Um, there is a small black power movement, there is a black liberation movement globally that black people politically in the UK tap it into. And Rastafari is a organizing cultural response, I think, for a lot of people. Um, yeah. you know, I, was just trying, I was just trying to contrast the, well, I use London as the focal point, but England in general. Well, I was just trying to contrast it with, say, Eric, you in the United States would not have had the same energy um, around Rastafari as, as um, you know, but it wasn't just Bob Marley. It, there were people before Bob Marley on the music scene as well. Um, and Reggae had a huge root in, in London. Well, England, right? Um, I feel like I'm not qualified to talk about music history in the same way anymore. <laughs> well, I, I can well, point out that in the United States, um, it was actually uh, Boston. Boston, for some reason, um, that was the place where uh, the United States got introduced to uh, reggae. I mean, there, there was small, um, well, a growing Caribbean community in, in Boston uh, in, in the 1960s. And that was the place, but it, but also just just this up up the road from from Boston, uh, in 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 Toronto, uh, so yeah, they they would just deal with these North American enclaves, but I think you had, but yeah, I would agree with you, Tony, that um, in the United States, uh, Rastafari, uh, was I mean we, we knew about it, especially in in like chocolate cities like like New Orleans or Washington D.C., um, we knew about it, we saw. The Rastas, uh, uh, but 
and Bob Marley, I think Bob Marley came became more popular after his death in the United States than when he was alive. Uh, I didn't start buying his stuff until I was in college in the 80s. Uh, knew about him, but um, I think our consciousness was raised, those, those of us who were from his generation, in the 80s. Uh, especially, I think, I think when the release of uh, Legend, um, you know, so... Bob Marley was with and, and, and other and other artists, uh, you know, Peter Tosh and, and others uh that, that that we gravitated to. Yeah, I guess I forgot yeah. about Steel Pulse, which is a terrible thing to admit. But they were from Birmingham, right? Um, around the corner in Handworth. Um absolutely all your um not so much a UK oriented, but um Marcus Garvey's ghost, Burning Spear. So it's, it's so there's a whole cultural movement that definitely Caribbean communities in the UK are absolutely plugged into um and it's very much shaping how we understand ourselves um definitely but the the proportion of the novel dedicated to bob being in the diaspora compared to being in jamaica is, is quite minute in my opinion um and even in terms of his um companion i could call him who returned to go to the university of the west indies mona so i'm wondering if that shows that there is a sort of love hate relationship with jamaica do you think that was suggested in the novel do you think it weighs more heavily in favor of love or in more heavily in favor of hate paula you're smiling <laughs> i don't see any hate at all <laughs> what i see is a deep abiding love which is accompanied by anxiety. Um, the, it's a kind of love you have for a, a, a family member who you think is going down the wrong path. So you're, you're, you're constantly anxious, but the anxiety doesn't diminish the love. So you're, what you're trying to do is talk them out of, the, of going down that path. I, I don't see hate at all. I see abiding abiding love yeah i absolutely uh, second that yeah i i just sort of second guessing rogie marcia douglas in this novel refers to and and bob marley has it in the lyrics of one of his songs to a good man is never honored in his own land right i don't know if that's the direction rogie was taking but um i think there was some sort of you know reference there to um that love hate thing that Roger may have been getting at. I don't know if I'm I'm second guessing you right, Roger, but she did play with that, Paula, several times. Um and I, I sort of wondered what the significance was. Was it that we was it that she was talking about Haley Selassie being the um the second coming of Christ, but not being recognized um, as that. Um, I, I don't know why she was playing a lot with, with, with those lyrics um, that Bob had in his... Let his me tell you song. why I think that the, this cannot be um, conceived of any kind of hate of Jamaica. In the beginning of the novel, before the novel... Oh, yeah, sorry, before the novel even begins... Um, in the give thanks portion, she says uh, one of the one of the things she gives thanks to is Jamaica, and she describes it as dread and powerful. Now, dread in in um, Ayarik or, or dread talk is never a bad word. Dread is a good word. The fact that she she describes Jamaica as dread and powerful says a huge amount then when the novel begins the first character we see is taino woman and taino woman sees the three ships coming towards jamaica she sees the man with hair the color of papaya and she says well we we're put into taino woman's head and she says he think um, he thinks he can take her Jamaica, land of wood and sweet river water, but this land is stubborn and will not be moved. I don't know how you could have a more robust declaration of love than that. Um, I don't see any hate. I see 
the anxiety of, of maybe, you know, the kind of anxiety, say, a mother has for a child. Um, but certainly I don't see how it could be interpreted as anything but love. Yeah, mm. I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I, I think it's the anxiety more than, um, well, not more than hate. I, I just don't see any hate myself. Yeah, I, I, I did see it as, a, well, I do see it as a criticism of colonialism and the legacies of colonialism uh, and how that uh, how that has shaped the say the late 70s early early 80s um, uh, and then as time goes on um, in the text um, I, I think I think there, there's there's one character in, in particular where I think, that 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 anti-colonialism really really is shown at least, at least in my eyes, um, and that's that's the figure of uh, at what the six at what the seven I don't I don't I don't know those English monarchs but uh, really the one that was the, the clock tower was 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 uh, dedicated to uh, so uh, if anything yeah I wouldn't say there's no no hatred toward Jamaica because to say that would be hatred toward people. Jamaica, Jamaica is the people. It's Edward the Seventh. I don't know uh, monarchs either, but I tried to remember him just for the purpose of the book. Otherwise, I, I'm quite happy to forget all of them. And, and that, that um, if, we, if we would go on, as, as Eric brought it up, um, the clock tower, I, you know, that's obviously a central part of um, where all these spirits met. Um, the significance, Paula, of Halfway Tree Road, the cotton tree, and what cotton means to us in the Caribbean, and that symbol of the colonial past, and the brutality, and the atrocities, the hanging. You know, um, Third World, actually, which is which is which is was a contemporary group then as well in the times that we're talking about. In that song, Ninety Six Degrees in the Shade, um, mentions that hanging, um, you know, uh, under the cotton tree. And as as a Jamaican, Paul, I, I think maybe you can enlighten us a bit more as to the I don't know the the historical significance of halfway tree road, that cotton tree that keeps coming up with its roots running through the whole of Jamaica by now. Um, <laughs> running through yeah. the whole of Jamaica in the novel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> actually, um, the silk cotton tree in Halfway Tree, as I think that I think Marcia mentions it in the beginning of the novel, that the silk cotton tree uh, was cut down to make way for the clock, for the erection of the clock, which was to honor Edward VII. Um, now, uh, the silk cotton has this significance in Jamaican folklore. The a silk cotton tree is not it's not cotton that that um that uh that they used to um grow in the south or even in, in, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines to create clothing. A silk cotton tree is a seba tree. And in Jamaican folklore the a silk cotton tree is a home for the ancestors that that it, I mean, Duppy live in silk cotton trees. Every good Jamaican knows that Duppy live in silk cotton trees, <laughs> and they're enormous. So they're very imposing. You know, um, it looks like something somewhere where a Duppy would live, where several Duppies would live. It's they're huge, huge, huge things. And um, the novel starts off well. I don't know if it starts off. It doesn't probably doesn't start off, but a, a, a very important event in the novel is the cutting down of the silk cotton tree to make way for for the clock, which honors this colonial um, king. And of of course, just just the thought of that is does so much violence to you to your head. Um, so I think it's a good way to set up the novel. Um, I probably am not answering Tony's question. No, I, Another I was... significant thing about yeah. Halfway Tree. Halfway Tree, we've spoken before about classism in, in Jamaica and how separate the, 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 the classes are in Jamaica. 
halfway tree is considered the meeting point of uptown and downtown. It's where uptown and downtown intersect. So everybody eventually, whether you're from uptown or downtown, you meet in halfway tree. Um, it's a major shopping center. Um, it's a major commercial district, in fact. Uh, so everybody, it, it brings, it's a hub for the whole of Kingston. So I, I think it has, I, I suspect that, that it, it had that kind of significance as well. That is why the, the Marcia decided to center Bob and our colonial past in, past in the form of, of Edward VII, to whom the clock is dedicated in Halfway Tree and particularly in that clock. And the fact that the clock never works, and I have checked recently. <laughs> I have gone onto um, YouTube where there is, a, you can see live video of Halfway Tree and the clock, and the clock is still not working. So I, I, that, that of course is very symbolic. Um, <laughs> that that this, this, the, the cotton tree is, is, is cut down to make way for this clock, which never works, which is broken, um, always broken. Hugely symbolic. Well, it, well, it's um, Haley Selassie's spirit and Bob Marley's spirit, and and the I was going to ask you the boy who was hanged on the the cotton tree. Who... I th I think that is um, an invention of of Marcia's. Mm, the mm. the ninety six degrees that you're thinking about, Tony, is actually about Paul Bogle. Um, it's about the Morant Bay Rebellion. That, okay. that, that, yeah, so it's not at all something that's centered in Kingston. So they're not, they're not connected? No, they're yeah. not. Mm -hmm. Right. So that invention of Marcia with the, the youngster who died with a word on his tongue, but um, we, get, we never get to know what it is. Um, yeah, that's what, just what, a, he, I think he's just there for symbolic reasons. I, he's not meant to be real. Can well, I... well, can oh, I ask sorry, a question? No, speak just as kind of riffing off your discussion um, about the the ah the character. So one of the things I really liked about the book is the way it draws in such a wide number of characters. Um, some of them are who real, some of them fiction, as you were kind of discussing, which is why the question popped into my head. And I just wondered were there any characters who appeared that surprised people? Uh, well, Kesua, before we get into that, as you mentioned characters, I think this would be a really good time for our listeners and viewers to see and hear Marcia Douglas in action, reading from a section of this beautiful novel. Hello, I am Marcia Douglas, and I am reading from The Marvelous Equations of the Dread. I'm going to share um, a short passage for you from the section Rastaman on the Run. And just to set this up a little bit, um, in this scene, um, Bob Marley has entered into a spirit yard um, with many other characters who have likewise returned from the dead. We need a plan, Nanny says, something great same as we imagine we nation, yet simple as a goat's milk. That's how the Maroons defeated the enemy. Who would have believed that we could defeat the British with a few roots and river stones and so-so weeds? A woman dressed in white beats a drum between her knees, three times three, tears run down her face, her lips tremble, three times three, her hands call sound up rising and skin deliverance. But how shall we start? The drums stop. The woman falls to the ground, her body shaken. Someone sprinkles her with white rum. She lets out a sigh and everyone is quiet. With the children, Bob says. He steps forward into the circle, still wet, from storm. My name is Robert Nesta Marley. I man used to play music, but before that me was a boy, had a pain in my heart. My heart so heavy, it beat with a one drop, one drop. Is music and Rastafari save me? 
but everyone don't so lucky. The youth them, me hear them ball at night outside in the road. And when them eye water dry up, them beat them one another. Is them we must start with. With one mighty force, calls Garvey. The little youth shall lead us. One by one, we must build an army. See la. Somewhere, a lizard begins to sing. The young girl Hortense rises up and Bob gives her the drum. Her small hands beat the skin, chanting down Babylon. The spirits sing Nyabingi and Nanny dances in the circle. She grasps the hem of her skirt as her feet inch the ground, working the perimeter. There is a scent of white rum and a swirl of mango leaf and bird feather. And this is how the drum speak, Zion train coming, Zion train coming. People get ready, Zion train coming. Zion is a place inside, calls Garvey. And this is what the drum speak, set the children free, set the children free, set the children free. Patsy zips up her boots and dances with Nanny in the circle. Who can't clap sing? Who can't sing clap? Who can't testify dance, she calls. Her feet dip and part, dip and part. A drought travels her spine and rises to her head. It pushes at the space between her scalp and funeral wig. She closes her eyes and whispers, rah. For this is what the drum speaks, Zion train coming, Zion train coming. Children get ready, Zion train coming. And the woman with the furious plait begins to cry. For she sees her great grands far, far on the other side. They have her guinea cheekbones and ashy skin. Zion is a place inside, she calls hoping they will hear. And her bare feet dance the words into the dust of the dirt road. Zion is, Zion is, her heels treading faster. Zion is, Zion is, Zion is, go the drums. And spirit feet massage the ground. But this is the real reason. There are almost 200 little earthquakes on the island per year. And why you should pay attention when the photo on the living room wall shifts sideways, your feet unsteady in the hallway. For this is how the long dead rock our fever babies or shake the youth from don't care. So Kesua, just before we took the reading, you were uh, talking about uh, our favorite characters. Um, would anyone like to talk about their favorite characters and why? And <laughs> I don't think Kessa was asking about favorite characters. Mm. Kessa was asked whether any character surprised us. Mm. And I'd like to um, answer that question. Meherene, she surprised me. Um, the, the lady who started off as a maid, a chambermaid to Haile Selassie and became his lover. Um, I was impressed that Marcia went there. Um, what I find about the novel, I, I find it, how it treats sexuality, very interesting. Um, throughout the novel, I think Marcia suggests that sexuality should not be closed in all kinds of mystery, that it's normal. Um, and I think that is why she chose to show his Imperial Majesty as a sexual being. I was, I thought it was risky, but I, I quite, I, I was fascinated by it. And another thing too about sexuality is she shows the relationship between Bob and Lena, which in my mind never actually turned into something sexual, even though it was always going there. I, I, I don't know. I can see that people there. I can see how you could s interpret that it was sexual. I thought it was going there, but Lena wouldn't allow it to actually be consummated. Um, but, and also, uh, speaking of sexuality again, um, Negus, who is fall down, 
um, the, the, the fallen angel whose body, body um, Bob inhabits when he comes back to Jamaica after his death. Negus is um, an angel whose job it is to create opportunities for sexual activity. Um, so all of that is, is really something fascinating. Yeah, that that section there, uh, well, those 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 allusions with 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 with, with Negus, uh, reminded me of uh, Rene de Pestre's uh, Hadrana and all her dreams, where there's a similar figure, not 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 in Fallen Angel, but uh, and I can't remember all the details. I read the book almost a year ago, but it was this this person or spirit that became like an insect and he was impregnating people <laughs> it's just wild because that 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 novel is borderline eroticism uh but it de definitely reminded me of, of of that um and yeah i mean that was risky i, I do agree i was risky to have uh Haile Selassie I, um as a sexual i mean depicting him as a sexual person but we're all sexual so I I, I don't know with it. I, I didn't find it so risky because if you if you really look at the the lineage of um, Rastafari, Haile Selassie, when we go back to Solomon, um, and you know we start to and and she does set the the, the tone, um, Solomon and his many wives. You know, I mean, this is. A, a defining thing about Rastafari as well, because that's that's a um, that's embedded in their thinking. They 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 are not necessarily well. I don't want to commit myself here with the statement, so let me just pull up. But they certainly go forth and multiply, right? And read what you want in between that. Um, so Paula, I I really. Didn't That's see... a stereotype, Tony. And... No, you think so? Because I didn't see um, any separation between what we expected of Haile Selassie and Bob Marley as well, because Bob Marley was, was portrayed as somebody who liked women. I mean, there was no covering that up in the novel. So, And I thought that Marcy was just saying, look, this is, this is an accepted norm. You say stereotype, I say an accepted norm. I, I, I kind of pose the question slightly because I was um, I loved the references to historical figures that kind of popped up and all kinds of historical figures from all well, not all kinds but a, a wide range of historical figures that don't necessarily all get space in the same spaces actually a lot of the time um, and I was particularly enamored and enamored is exactly the right word because I just thought wow that was fantastic um, when Marcus Garvey rebukes, rebuke, where, um, no, not Marcus Garvey rebukes, where I think Bob Marley rebukes Marcus Garvey for having called Haley Celestia a coward, which is, 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 you know, a real thing that happened uh, back in the 1930s. And, and my little historian's head was like, Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo! Um, but also um, the way it was done in the book was it was marvelous. Um, oh, no yeah. pun intended. Loved it, loved it, loved, loved the appearance of Marcus Garvey. I thought. I thought he cemented the the dialogue um, and the thoughts that Bob Marley was having, um, and the question that he asked even of um, Haile Selassie. Uh, but yeah, McGarvey in there, yes. I mean, because that's. I, I mean, I, I, I would I would argue that part of the movement is rooted in Garvey's philosophy, uh, and Garvey himself. I think I think Garvey is recognized as a as a prophet. Am I am I correct on that? Yes, you are. Yeah. Um, yeah, but to get back, Tony, to why um, I think it's risky, um, I don't believe that this novel challenges in any, any serious way um, the divinity of his imperial majesty. Um, it, it's, I, I believe that the novel doesn't really, doesn't really um, 
dispute that, dispute the divinity of his imperial majesty. His imperial majesty is not presented in the way that the Judeo-Christian God is pre presented. He is not presented as infallible. Um, but I think this whole novel suggests to me that infallibility is not something that is necessary in order for somebody to be great or even good. Um, I think that is a strong message that, that this novel presents, that you needn't be infallible to be a great person. Um, speaking of Bob, I'm, his Imperial Majesty in the novel says, uh, even great, even great persons, uh, I can't remember the exact quote, sometimes they don't learn as fast as they should. Um, but, you know, so, so I, I, that is a theme I see running through the novel, that goodness and greatness are, infallibility is not a requirement, because it, it, it speaks about um, not only Bob's failings, not only his imperial majesty's weaknesses. Um, we, we already mentioned Marcus Garvey. It seriously challenges, Bob seriously challenges Marcus Garvey on that issue of, of his pronouncement on his, on his imperial majesty. So, yeah. And not only that, others challenge Marcus Garvey as well. And I think it's interesting that she chooses sometimes women to bring out as characters to to, to to highlight the weaknesses of the men as you as, as you as you've mentioned you know because we're talking at something of a um what well, triumvirate of major figures right marcus garvey bob marley and Haley selassie but each of them is is, is not i don't want to say brought down by a woman that's not what i mean but each of them I has remember. I remember what you're met. You're, I think I remember what you're referring to, Kessa, where, where the dance hall queen, Patsy, challenges um, Marcus Garvey. She says, too much preaching. Um, there is too much preaching. And he agrees with her. Um, and she, the, sorry, go ahead. No, but, but at the same time, the irony of that is, of course, she's like, what we need is to go back to Africa. So there's also a lack of kind of understanding about who you're attacking, right? Not really, because Marcus what? Garvey, I think Marcus Garvey in the novel, he agrees that the go back to Africa message that he was um, putting forward is no longer necessary. Because what one of the things he says is that we need to go back to Africa in our minds. Um, you know, Rast speaking of Rastafari, because Rastafari is so important to this book, um, one of the things Rastafarians often say is Africa was born in us. And it's a phrase that I love so much um, because I don't have to be born in Africa to claim my Africanness. It's born in me. Um, and I think it's a similar message that uh, Marcus Garvey is modifying his message in the novel. He, he is suggesting that um, the, the, going back to Africa is, is, is something we need to do in our minds. Just as, as a search for Zion is, is something that has to be done in our minds. It's not a physical place that we need to go to. Right? And that, the novel says that very, very clearly, that it's, it's in our minds. Well, I think it captures that Africanness, Africanness in one of his songs. Um, I can't remember the name of the song, but the, 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 it's no matter where you come from, as long as you're a black man, you're an African. Um, that, 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 you know, you just reminded me of that. And I think that's what Peter Tosh was also capturing. It's born mm -hmm. in you. You're black, you're African. You don't have to be going back to Africa or born in Africa to, to prove that you're an African. So I, mm. I think that that's a fair point, Paula. Here, 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 here. That's 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 what I preach. Uh, you know, and I, I don't think that's I don't think I can preach that enough in my teaching and my scholarship. But there is one character that goes to Africa. We haven't mentioned him yet. Actually, yeah, yeah, there, there's this one, and he's I think I, I think he's an important character, even though he doesn't get a lot of doesn't get a lot of time, but I think he's really, really important. Riverman? 
That's yes. what you're referring to? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So tell me, Eric, why do you think he is such an important character? I'm curious. I think he's important because of, of, of his role, uh, his, his role as like a sweeper um, in and around uh, Haile Selassie's apartment and, and, and in the apartment. And he's, he works in proximity to uh, the chambermaid, Meheron. Uh, and he knows what's going on, but he chooses to, to, to remain silent and, and, and he's accepting of certain things. So I think your point before Paula about the unnecessary quality of infallibility, I think is reflected in his, let's, let's, let's call them actions, even though he chooses to remain silent and he was almost blamed for being like a rat. Um, but he didn't see it, it on outside. He didn't seem like he knew what was going on, but really he did. He knew he knew exactly what was going on. So he was really attentive. Um, and that, that was a key, a, a key moment in, in the history of Ethiopia that she places him in. So I, I thought I thought that was creative and, and, and very imaginative. It was. And I, I I feel like we're forgetting to mention that Bob returned to Jamaica as fall down and not necessarily that he returned to the homeland in Ethiopia, but he returned to Jamaica as fall down. Do you think that was an appropriate way for um, Marcia Douglas to, to characterize the sort of return? I think it gives her a lot um, to work with. I think it's a, it's a, it's a good, um, it's a good uh, narrative technique to have Bob transmogrified into the body of one, a fallen angel, two, a man who is perceived as, um, as a madman, three, a man who is a rival for a woman that um, Bob is in love with. Um, it gives her, it's a wonderful technique, it gives her so much to work with. Um, so she can, she can invite her readers to question whether what we perceive as madness is in fact madness. We can, it gives her, it, ju it just gives her a lot of opportunities. Um, she gets an opportunity to speak about reality, whether, how we perceive reality. Um, that the, is this the only, the, this fear that we live in now? Is this the only reality there is? because I think the novel suggests that there are other realities, that there are other realms, um, spiritual realms that are just as real as the realm in which we live in. Um, you know, so I, I, I just think it's a, it's a really good narrative technique to have created this character. And I mean, it, it was quite, at first it was really fascinating that she, um, that that she brought him back as a quote unquote madman um, because these are people who are ostracized in society. And, and, and she, she demonstrated that because, you know, when he went to different um, places, different houses, and he was sort of like, you know, ignored or, or, or laughed at and so on. And even though he was technically Bob and people didn't see that, um, I think that demonstrated a really powerful point that these are people um who are ostracized in society, but maybe he wasn't so different to Bob other than he wasn't famous, <laughs> you know? Um, quite frankly, I don't know if it taught me anything because if I, if I, if I were to see a man who um, doesn't look like Bob um, coming up to me and saying, it's me, Bob, I would laugh too. I would have been, <laughs> I remember one of the first scenes was when the policeman saw him in front of, um, in front of um, 56 Hope Road. And he said, it's me, Bob, I looking for Rita. And the policeman laughs and drives off. I would have reacted exactly the same way. So I don't know if this, nov this novel helped cure me of any of my prejudices. <laughs> but it's also a play on, on that whole thing about returning is also, to me, I don't know if I'm going too deep, but it's also that religious thread of of the, the I'm not saying Bob is a coming a third coming of Christ, but but it's 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 this whole idea that these people return and when they return you won't recognize them. 
you just want you know so i i think that was also going on in in that and it's something the character grapples with right because he then says maybe if i talked to her about things that only she and i would know about she would recognize me but if you just say i'm bob no of course anyone could say that he's a famous person literally anyone could say that but he needs to speak in a language that only they had only they shared so that she would know that actually it really was him in a different body but as you i just want to roll back a bit because we were talking about the those who the one character that Riverman who went to Africa. But there's also another character in the book who I think it's Lena's grandfather who um disappeared uh, for for all intents and purposes. But his main ambition was the, the Marcus Garvey um call to to go back to Africa. So so there was some significance there I feel in in making that point. Um certainly at that stage in, in, in the novel. Um, I want to throw out a question as well. The, as we're talking about Lena's grandfather, that whole coming across from Cuba, um, what's, I was kind of trying to see what was the significance of, of the linkages there, Paula. I don't know if I was... Could I, 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 I take that one? Much. Well, Kessa was, wants to take that on because I really have no clue. Well, isn't it because in the 1930s you have a huge uh, return of Jamaicans expelled, not just Jamaicans either, people expelled from Cuba because of the sugar crisis there, if I remember correctly, the history, Eric, correct me if I'm wrong here. And so you do have this, and so a lot of the time we think about the labor rebellions, the 1930s, people say that people who have been in Cuba were a big part of it, and obviously, and not obviously, but also Cuba was a big center for UNIA activity. A lot of Caribbean people of Anglophone descent from the British being Caribbean who had migrated to Cuba had been a big part of the Gulf movement in Cuba. And so they're very organized, they're very active politically, and then they return to the English speaking Caribbean uh, around the time of the Labour rebellions, preceding it somewhat. So I think she's, and so I think one of the things that is marvelous, again, about the book is the way she draws these kind of real histories and then kind of fictionalizes them and turns them around. And I think my question was on a similar note, my last question was, do we think that it's dangerous what she does because she's taking real histories and mixing them up with these stories um or is it exciting because she obviously knows the history clearly so she can play around with it in a way that you know when you know the rules you can mix them up but if you don't know the history is it going to be confusing and i say dangerous i'm, I'm being facetious a little bit i think it's 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 great because she's using all these different historical fixes all these things that really did happen mix them with things that didn't happen um, and asking us, I think, to figure out what's going on, what where do we go from here type thing. And she does it all, I think, as Paul said at the beginning, from a space of love for Jamaica, right? She's kind of trying to throw all the possible solutions out. Um, mm. But is it is it okay that she doesn't always point to historical facts? She doesn't reference. Yeah. She's not saying, read this book for more information. She's just kind of telling you her version. And in answering this, um, we could also give our final thoughts of the novel. So, Tony? Well, I, I was going to say, guess what? That's what I really liked about the novel, you know. I, I read it almost like a student of Marcia Douglas. It's almost as if she was lecturing me. Um, so she opened a lot of facets of my mind um, to do some historical research. Um, the bits that I lived through was refreshing, you know, because of my um, age and the generation that she was dealing with. So that was refreshing. Um it, I, the, the book appealed to me on many aspects, Roger, if, if you want my final thoughts. It's definitely something I can't rate under a five, five being the maximum. And I, I, um, I just immersed myself into her rhythm. And, you know, a book written, written in bass could not be more aptly described, um, to be honest. Um, and I was pleasantly... Surprised, I was a little apprehensive at first. Um, am I going to really get into this? But I was in it, man, from, from, from the word go. So yes, Roger, it's a five for me, and it's a novel that I enjoy. All right, Eric? Yeah, I mean, the, as I mentioned before, the, the historical references were, were, just, were, were just great. And I, and I, I had no problems with the... Um, interspersing of people like Bob Marley's father um, into 
getting putting him in the same space with 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 with, with Marcus Garvey, but at, but at a different time in in the clock tower, and that that section had me laughing. Uh, the the chant, uh, "I'm a coward, I'm a white coward, I'm a white Jamaican coward." I mean, <laughs> I did laugh, did laugh, did laugh. So, you know, I I, I love that about the text. Uh, so overall, I mean, I I rated I rated a four. Um, I, it, it did take me some time to to really get into it, and and maybe that was because I was doing other stuff and reading other stuff at the same time. But um, once I got rolling, yes, the the rhythm the rhythm took me, swept me away. You know, that's why I knew you throughout the question, but um, you could also um get in there. Um, I can't even remember my own question now. <laughs> so I'll just go with the rating. <laughs> um, oh, it's about how the history thing. Yeah, I'm not sure the answer. That's why I asked the question, really. Uh, final thought question. I really loved the interspersing of history and and fiction. Um, it's something that I think is is beautifully done in the novel. Um, I struggled to get into it a little bit. I, it took me by surprise. I wasn't sure I liked how she handled um, disability in the deaf character, if I'm completely honest. And so for that reason, I'm going to give it a four, but it's incredibly creative as a novel. I think it definitely requires several readings and it will be going on my students' historical fiction from the Caribbean list, which is always a good thing. Um, I mean, which just means I think it's great. I just personally am still grappling with it. Um, but in intensely valuable as a teaching tool, certainly, um, and enjoyable. I also laughed incredibly, like intensely when, um, and like I was choking laughing with the children scene um the, the the way she writes the kids I, I i was crying absolutely crying so um it's a four for me thank you marcy for writing this yeah and, and for me I, I i definitely um loved the way she in she, she, she interwove the, the the history and and gave her own version of events and her own style um to things that was definitely beautiful and, we need and... paula's written to roger oh, 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 oh. you're you trying to wrap up the program but we no have to hear I, from paula. I have definitely not wrapping up the program because i'm leaving paula for last for a very special reason <laughs> but i definitely loved it i give it a, a four and a half i'll upgrade it to a four and a half out of five paula this is one of my favorite novels of all time my rating is infinity out of five um, when Kesawa was having some problems getting into it, I wrote a note to the group to say that you have to surrender yourself to this novel, the way you surrender yourself to poetry. Just let the rhythm, just, just, just let the, the ride on the wave of the rhythm. Ride the rhythm. That's how you have to enjoy this, <laughs> this, this book. Um, don't try to analyze every sentence. Um, just ride it. Just ride it. Eventually, it will come together. This is one of the most amazing novels I've ever read in my life. And I've read a lot of novels. That's it for me. Tony, you see why I left her for last? <laughs> there was a reason. Thank you very much for joining in another episode of Page Turners Plus. This was our reflections on Marcia Douglas's The Marvelous Equations of the Dread. The next time you see us, we'll be interviewing Marcia Douglas. Thank you for joining us. Have a lovely day.